Hi guys, good morning. Um, so uh, it's actually, I guess, an area that we worked a little bit uh, when we did the cadaver uh, dissection. So, uh, so before you guys embark on thoracic Albert syndrome, you know, I want to just make you aware that it's a um, it's a highly controversial topic in a sense because it's still there's a lot of litigation involved with that operation. You know, so uh, you know part of it is you know patient satisfaction and maybe part of it is we don't really good job explaining to patients or the expectations, but. Um, anyway, I'm not a, I don't have a big thoracic outlet practice, but uh, uh, and the, the incidence are up to 2%. Usually we see it in the younger age group, and contrary to other like vascular disease that are more common in males and females, you know, some, this is actually more common in, in, in females, four times more common. So there's other names that we call it. Some people use the cervical rib syndrome, uh, scaly anterior syndrome, costoclavicular syndrome, the hyperadduction syndrome. Uh, so basically it refers to a spectrum of syndromes related to the thoracic outlet. So, uh, so you can kind of divide into two areas, the area between the spine, clavicle, and the first rib, and I'll show you some pictures la later, and also the lower part of the neck in the paraclavicular area extending into the front of the shoulder. Um, so the anterior scalene, like we talked in the cadaver session, so most of you guys know that the anterior scalene basically originates uh, from C4, C5, also the middle scalene, and actually they both uh, end up on the first rib. Um, so as you can see here, they both end the first rib. Uh, sometimes, you know, you might get this, uh, this question on your boards is that the posterior scaling actually goes to the second rib, not the first rib. Um, so keep that in mind. And as you can see, it's a very busy, you know, anatomical area, right? I mean, you have all these structures, um, as you can see, uh, kind of in a, in a narrow space. And, you know, you add the subclavius muscle and its uh, attachments, you know, add some other problems. You can see how it can get really busy. Um, one thing that you guys, I think every single one who worked with a cadaver injured this nerve, um, um, which is the phrenic nerve, and as you guys know, it has a you know, special trajectory, it goes from lateral to medial, so, uh, but obviously you have to take down the anterior scalene to get to the uh, subclavian. Um, so the brachial plexus uh, is formed by the ventral rami of spinal nerves C5 to 8 and T1, and then along with the, uh, then along with the subclavian artery, uh, subclavian artery um, oops, blank, where is that? Oops, sorry. And along with, this, with the, obviously with the subclavian artery, uh, they go through the interscalene space uh, basically between the anterior and the middle um, uh, middle scalene muscles, uh, as you can see in this picture. And then eventually they join the vein and then um, they go through the pectoral myelin with insertion, which is called the subpectoral space. And now, you know, there's a lot of people talk about, you know, the actually the pec minor um, causing some compression also on, these, uh, on this bundle too. So... Um, so first, if you want to look at, if you divide them into three spaces, you can divide the scalene uh, muscle space, and then you have the um, uh, costoclavicular space, and then the pec minor space. So let's start with one, one at a time. So if you look at the uh, scalene uh, muscle space, basically it's bounded by the anterior scalene, the middle scalene, and the first rib, right? So, and then also we did that dissection in the cadaver. And this is the most common site for the neurogenic uh, thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, and it contains the brachial plexus and the subclavian artery. So if you look at the costoclavicular space, and you can see how easily the vein can be compressed in this area, and you have the uh, ligament that could be, you know, uh, um, hypertrophied in, in, in athletes. Um, so uh, this, uh, this space is bordered by the clavicle, the subclavius muscle, and the first rib. And, and obviously, as you can see, all three structures here pass through this space. Uh, and in this space, the vein is most commonly, uh, most commonly compressed. And the uh, puck minor, um, um, which we're learning more and more about it, uh, you know, it's, it's something also you have to think about when patients come in with recurrent TOS, uh, sometimes they could have the puck minor uh, space um, uh, compression in, the, in that area. Uh, it's a, obviously, it's the least common site. It's, it's one area you have to think about uh, recurrence. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> again, this is just like a view to show you how, like, uh, from, a normal, from a normal view, uh, compared to when you have, you know, athletic uh, patients, uh, you know, where the muscle, uh, the subclavius muscle and the, and the ligaments gets really thickened, how easily the, um, uh, the structures can be compressed. Yeah, we talked about the plaque minor, about recurrent incomplete relief for in the neurogenic patients. So again, so li like I said, it's, it's, um, it's a busy anatomical space. It's a very dynamic space, right? I mean, think about it, swimmer, 
you know, baseball players, volleyball players, you know, waiters, and you know, um, the, 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 one of the patients I saw recently that had this problem. He's actually the carpenter, and he, you know, he puts his hands a lot above his head. So, so, um, so you have that. You have that tight space. Add some other abnormalities. You know, thick muscle, some uh, 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 osseous changes, and, and you know, for, uh, cervical rib. So you could see how could um, uh, all this can lead to like some inflammation and some problems in that um, uh, in that area. And also, don't forget some trauma. A lot of times, you have patients that tell you that they had, you know, broken uh, clavicle or something, and now they're having uh, some some problems in that area. So this is the cervical rib. As you can see, it's pinching um, on the um, uh, on the brachial plexus and also compressing on the uh, subclavian uh, artery. Um, and then the the um, sorry. So um, obviously, ob all of you guys know that the neurogenic is the most, the most common type. Uh, now, if you look at the uh, pediatric or people, you know, kids, I guess, under 18, actually neurogenic and venous is kind of equal. Uh, but, uh, but in adults, uh, neurogenic by far is, is the most common one. So um, again, I know Dr. Mattis likes to talk probably more about diagnosis and pathogenesis. But basically, when you're seeing those patients, you really want to have a detailed history and physical for these patients, ask them, you know, uh, look from is it related uh, to hyperextension neck injury? Is it related to activity and occupation, or is it because they have some abnormal structures that's compressing these uh, one of these structures? Um, you know, again, as you can see, patients that have what we call static postures, they're sitting at the desk all day working, so uh, or the computer, they could have some of, some of these um, uh, problems. Uh, like we talk about uh, uh, any activity or, or work that you have to do with your hands being above your head for, for a lot of time in, in a repetitive fashion. Uh, athletes, you know, pitchers, volleyball players, swimmers, again, you have to think about these uh, um, in, this, in, in, in this case. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the abnormal first rib and cervical rib, but mainly about like the incidence. So it happens in 1% of the population. It's twice more common in, in female. Now, if you have it, that doesn't mean you're going to have thoracic outlet syndrome. So keep that in mind. So it's not like if you see it, you have to take it out, OK? But you need to kind of educate the patient a little bit. So if the patient has it, you can tell them, look, you're 10 times more likely you're going to have problems down the line. And you can kind of educate. Same thing like we educate patients about stroke symptoms or TIA. So this is the same thing. That doesn't mean you have to take it out if you see it. Um, and then also if it's 50% bilateral. I mean, the only time where it's relative indication, let's say, um, uh, patient had embolized, and I'll show you pictures. Sometimes they could embolize from, from, from as you can see in this picture, um, you have some postsynodic dilatation, they form an aneurysm, and you know, then they form thrombus, and if they shower, and they cause the like, same thing, the blue toe syndrome, they can have some blue finger syndrome. Uh, or, so then you can kind of say, okay, I'm gonna take the other side um, uh, cervical rib so that the same thing doesn't happen, or you can just watch them closely. Um, and then most cervical ribs are commonly embedded in fibers of, of the uh, middle scaly muscle and displace both the subclavian artery and the brachial plexus. And I have pictures later to show you that. And then again, the abnormal, I mean, the rationale for taking out the first rib is that, you know, all these ligamentous and muscle attachments are attached to the first rib. So yes, so you have to take it, if you take it out, you release all these attachments. So as you can see, so this is a complete um, cervical rib. And this is um, incomplete, where it's, you have all these fibrous attachments to the, to the first rib. And as you can see, the brachial plexus is displaced upwards. Um, and then we talked a little bit how you could have uh, postsynodic dilatation, thrombus formation, and then they could, you know, shower um, into the finger. So this is like one presentation that it might give you on the boards, or the other one would be like the pulsatine supraclavicular mass. And you have to think about this uh, when you get this on your, on your exam. So uh, other abnormalities you have to look for, also the long transfer C7 process, uh, process patients that have in the first rib fracture and there's malunion or um, a lot of inflammation from uh, healing, uh, bifid first rib, clavicle malunion, uh, poor posture, and some other soft uh, tissue abnormalities like the one I showed you or the scaly minimus and hypertrophy subclavius uh, muscle. Uh, other things to worry about or be careful when we did, we didn't do that in the dissection. We actually showed, we looked at the middle scaly muscle, but if you're going to be taking out the middle scaly muscle, um, you have to be careful injuring this nerve. Do you guys know which, which nerve is that? Yeah, the long thoracic nerve. So you have to be careful, otherwise I have a winged uh, scapula. The other one you have to uh, worry about, the phrenic nerve. I don't know you guys don't care. You just went, you just cut it in the cadaver. I hope you don't do that in real life. Um, and obviously the sympathetic ganglion, you could also injure uh, when, you're, when you're doing that dissection. And obviously the thoracic duct um, is another one you can injure on the left side. 
So um, one thing I noticed when you're looking, and obviously we don't see this a lot, but one thing I noticed, that if you look at the chest x-ray, um, it's, I mean, as you can see here, you can see the, the cervical rib. If you don't really uh, notice that um, abnormal structure, I mean, a lot of times it's like pneumothorax. I mean, if you, it, it's, if you see something um, uh, with, with, a, with a pneumo, so you don't see the, uh, the shadowing of the lungs, and you know, it's a pneumo. And this is the same thing kind of when you look at it. I mean, it's hard, like, you know, to look at it and be like, oh, maybe this is it, it's not. This actually has a typical appearance where, where you know, basically like we said it starts um, in, this, in, the C, in the C7, C6, C7 area and goes in the, on, the first, um, on the first rib, the, those the cervical rib. So, um, so I think when you, the next time you see one, I think you're gonna miss it. Um, so a little bit about anatomy. Also, we talked about that when we did the cadaver. So, um, uh, so the axial artery basically, so the subclavian, as we talked about, is divided right by the anterior scalene, right into three parts by the anterior scalene. And then, um, for those who did the cadaver session with me, then it becomes the axial artery lateral edge of the first rib, and also it's divided into three parts by the pec minor. Okay, so, and then, uh, and then the first segment of the axial artery has one branch, the second one has two, and the third segment has three branches. And then the brachial artery becomes, or the axial becomes the brachial artery at the lateral edge of the terrain major, okay? So remember that, and then it also divides into the ulnar and the radial. So this is basically, um, uh, one thing, I don't know if you guys see a lot of the dialysis patients, but sometimes you know, you'll be surprised you do an angiogram on these patients, and then you see this huge, interosseous uh, vessel and you think it's a radial artery. So one thing is when you're doing those angiograms, just make sure that the, you know, the palm is facing up uh, so that you don't get that confusing picture because I mean, the, really the interosseous, the interosseous branch could become a really major, major branch supplying the hand. But when you display it, so the radial artery really should actually kind of follow the, the, the ulnar bone. So, um, I mean, there's sorry, the radius, um, you know, radius bone. So if it doesn't, then you have to be, uh, you have to think that it's probably the interosseous membrane, it's not your uh, radial artery. So think of that when you're doing hand angiograms. So about venous uh, structures, I know all of you guys know, um, you have the cephalic vein, this is cephalic arch, and then the, the brach uh, brachial vein and the basilic vein and joining into the axillary vein. And a lot of times you see a lot of problems in the, in the cephalic um, uh, junction in dialysis patients. Um, I know Dr. Peden, um, um, I know, actually I'm not sure who's giving the dialysis talk later, but uh, he might be talking about that a little bit. Um, if you look at the forearm of venous anatomy, uh, again, you have the median uh, antecubital vein and the, uh, um, uh, uh, your median uh, cubital vein. And sometimes you actually end up using one of those when you do your fistulas, because as you can see, when you, when, uh, you know, I'm sure all of you guys do your ultrasound. So you look at your ultrasound and you see uh, which one, um, sorry, you know, you can see how, it's, how it, the drainage is and basically either you know, cut it here, cut it here, and transpose it on, on the uh, brachial artery uh, for, uh, for um, fistula formation. Uh, again, this is just to show you different variations. Actually, uh, the Methodist group looked at that, and they actually showed that uh, you could have different variations how the basilic vein drains. Uh, as you can see, those, the ones that drain um, early could be prob problematic when you do first stage fistulas because you really can't mobilize and do a transposition, so I always keep that in mind. Um, and again, if you can do these operations on the hand, you know, you really need to know your anatomy. Um, so if you have an injury to the axillary artery, you have inability to AB duct your shoulder. Uh, the muscular cutaneous, you'll have a weak shoulder and elbow flexure. And then uh, the radial artery, usually the wrist drop, you kind of tell them just to push against your hand with the wrist. Um, for the median nerve, you know, they will call it the hand of prediction. You basically try to, you know, push between the, uh, uh, their thumb and the uh, index finger and ulnar base. You tell them to spread their fingers and try to push them, uh, push them together. That's it, perfect, on time. Yeah.